Welcome to Season 7 of the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast. This is where we chat with experts in the field, patients who use these devices, physical therapists, and the vendors who make it all happen. Our goal? To share stories, tips, and insights that ultimately help our patients get the best possible outcomes. Tune in and join the conversation. We are thrilled you are here and hope it is the highlight of your day. Hello, everyone. My name is Joris Peels, and this is another episode of the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast with Brent Pike. Mm-hmm. How you doing, Brent? Doing well, man. You know what's crazy, man? People actually listen to us. <laughs> We've been listened to in over 80 countries, and over 40% of that is outside of the United States. And I just think that's an amazing story to tell. And a special thanks to our listeners as well. And you've got some other news. I'm really proud and happy to say that we have a sponsor for this show. And uh, it's Vorum. So Vorum is like an end-to-end kind of software solution. Anything from tool pathing software to uh, carving to, you know, any kind of solution that, that you would need to, to for an end-to-end tools and OMP professional. So, um, and, and yeah, they also offer scanning, right? They, they have like scanning solutions, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that's one of the neat things about what Vorum's doing is that is not only with the end to end, you know, scanning is such a foundational part of what we do. It is the foundation of what we do. You get a bad scan, you're going to have a bad end product. And one of the things that they've, they've released is this uh, Luma 3D scanner. And it is an end-to-end solution, but you can do all your digital landmarking. You can clean things up. You can pause and remove, uh, resume scans. You can put patient data on there. Uh, and you can also, you know, it goes to a Windows uh, Surface Pro, or you can put a tether on it um, for those kind of weird-to-reach places or underneath a foot or what have you. So you can actually not have to have it on the screen itself, which is which is pretty interesting because there's some other options out there that use like an iPad or even the iPhone. But you talk about getting into a weird angle uh, without a tether. That's what happens. And so I, I think it's really neat what they've done. And just watching some of the videos of how you can clean up the scans and such has been really, uh, really, really neat. Okay. Yeah, good. Uh, I like this, dude. It seems like a you know, integrated solution, scanner, software, clean up kind of stuff plus your workflow from one vendor so you know that that that, if that's all you know works together really nice it's a beautiful way to 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 not get any headaches and have one supplier for this key element of uh, obtaining that scanning information so yeah sounds really good sounds really solid and uh, thank you so much for Vorum for sponsoring this episode all right but in this episode is special to me and i wanted to give a little bit of context before we hop in almost to the middle of a conversation of what joris and I had to say about creating access worldwide for people that need prostheses. Listen in. Uh, Katie Leatherwood, Mm -hmm. who we've had on the show, Mm -hmm. uh, that lives in Latvia, has been there for a while, came and visited us at uh, not only East Point, (laughs) but Advanced 3D. Uh And we just had a great discussion. And, um, you know, it really led me to think like, there's obviously multiple ways uh-huh. to reach people, uh-huh. right? Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, Katie uh, is unlike many other orthotists and uh-huh. prosthetists, she actually lives in Latvia yeah. and has since 2018. Mm-hmm. And so she set her roots up. She has a team that help her on the technical side of things, mm-hmm. um, but then also travel where she can't travel as a, as an American. Mm-hmm. But then um, she has also taken the time to do the things the right way so she has a nonprofit that's established in Latvia, mm-hmm. also has the nonprofit in the U.S., but then she also has a for-profit mm-hmm. um, prosthetic a place in Latvia as well. Mm-hmm. And I think she's doing a very nice job kind of melding the two. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I know we've talked about this before, mm-hmm. but, I, you know, I think it would be interesting to to talk a little bit more about so it. So just the idea of how to get everyone prosthetics, something like that, or how to spread yeah. okay, okay. So how, how 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 do we do it? Do, do you do it with nonprofit? Mm-hmm. Do you do it with business? Mm-hmm. Is it going to mix of both with life mm-hmm. enabled? And then we've had some other people mm-hmm. on, like Jeff Aronstone mm-hmm. from uh, Operation Namaste, mm-hmm. um, you know, Katie, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I think, else? We had, um, I think, you know, Paul mm-hmm. on from uh, mm-hmm. Lev Legacy. You know, all those. It's, I think it's, it'd be an interesting discussion. Okay, okay, that's cool. We can do that. We can do that. But, okay, so first off, let's just talk to a couple of scenarios, I think. I think I think the first thing, let's call this the integrated scenario with, with uh, Kay's doing this idea. I have a nonprofit for, I guess, the poorest or the people that can't be reached, right? I, I also make a practice to to build capacity in the country, and I live in the country. And I love this very much, and I think I think I think I think it's a really good. There's only it's very dependent on one person though. It's it's her charisma and her work, life's work, if you will. And with these organizations, it's difficult for me to see like you know if she falls away or if she can't do this anymore, you know, who's she going to take to power that through? So there's a lot of capacity building, but there's also some organizational design. She has to find ideally like a young twenty year old Latvian who's like going to make you know going to carry that forward to the generation. So that's a very and like every small business, you know. You know, small business has to have, okay, it's the family maybe, but there has to be people in that organization to carry it forward. I think that's, it's very people dependent, that kind of approach. So it may be very limiting, but it can be very long lasting if it's done right. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I think that's an interesting uh, way to put it. And I think, you know, what you said and, and just the, I mean, Katie's, uh, I mean, she's younger than me. It's a young gish. Um, and she is really investing into local people. And so like this idea of, uh, and I think she even used it, like what happens if I get hit by a Mack truck? Those, those, are, those are real decisions. The, ha- the chance of that, that happening happen- in Europe are- is very little, very low. But, but <laughs> right, if she right. would get hit by a Volvo truck <laughs> yeah. or a Renault, well, you know, so- <laughs> that, that chance is much higher. Well, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and just the 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 nature. I mean, Latvia is very mm-hmm. safe, but there's it, it, around mm-hmm. that conflict area, there are other things that could happen. So who who can carry that torch? And so that's a that's an important discussion to have. Mm-hmm. And I think she's really having that discussion. So that's what makes me excited about mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. Uh, sort of thing. Um. So yeah. So I like this integrated model. Mm-hmm. You know, let's let's talk a little bit about. Mm-hmm. The, so so that's the integrated mm-hmm. model, right? So then. You know, what are some other options? You've mm-hmm. got the, uh, you know, complete nonprofit realm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and let's just go. Well, let's go to the other one. The other, the other one is the airdrop prosthetics realm. Like, kind of like, oh, that's yeah, a good you one. know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, we, we come and we, like, make some video and stuff. Everybody takes a two-week vacation. And I think I think there's some examples of this really working. And I've, I've seen some ex- I'm going to have to anonymize this. because I've seen some examples of these people raising money to go. And then they raise like money, and then most of it is like plane tickets for them, and they get a whole bunch of pictures taken with smiling children, and the effectiveness is really low. That's a one one like bad example. I, I also know that there's like these these what are these eye surgeons and stuff? They have like a plane outfitted with like a like a uh, yeah. with like a uh, complete surgery and everything, and they go, and it's also their free time, and they're really that seems really effective because it's a procedure. You walk in, do it, boom, and all of a sudden you don't have a, a, a cataract or whatever, right? So, so I think those are the two extremes of that kind of the vacation model, right? Where you're you're parachuting in there, you're doing something where one is it's not effective because it's way too expensive, right? You're, 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 the plane ticket is is fifteen hundred bucks, and then uh, and then you get, you're giving five hundred dollars worth of goods to people. And the other one is a super effective, like you're taking these really amazing surgery people and they're, they're it's only two weeks, but they'll do a thousand patients in, in whatever country, right? And I think with orthopedics, there's this aftercare thing, and that always kind of really makes this model for me a really, really problematic. Yeah, no, and I and I agree. And and you know, for and one thing that we didn't talk about with what Katie's going on, is like for the prosthetic market. You know, people are changing all the time. They're losing weight, gaining weight. Mm-hmm. They might have had, you know, a few extra tortillas, mm-hmm. you know, some salty mm-hmm. beans in their uh, beans and rice, mm-hmm. which makes them retain fluid. And then all of a sudden they're bigger and they can't get into their prosthesis. Mm-hmm. So having somebody local mm-hmm. um, that can actually lead them through that, because it's a journey mm-hmm. of this fluctuation because you've got a real live human that their body's changing all the time mm-hmm. and it's something that doesn't change. Mm-hmm. And I, and um, we can go into that another mm-hmm. time of, mm-hmm. because I think that's part of the sockets is there should be some opportunity for these things to change mm-hmm. um, and and people self-manage that. Mm-hmm. So, but what Katie, when, uh, one interesting thing that Katie had done mm-hmm. is she has her people that take care of some of the follow-ups and make sure mm-hmm. that everything's going well. But mm-hmm. she also will do like video follow-up calls mm-hmm. on a, a very frequent basis. And so this one guy uh, who was in the Ukraine, mm-hmm. 
um, said, hey, I'm up to 10, they're called ply of socks, two socks, very thick. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a known dimension. And she goes, not a problem. I'm going to reduce the socket file that you currently have, 3D print it. Mm -hmm. And then when my guy is uh, back there next week, he's going to take it and put it on you. Love it. And sure enough, it, it happened. And so that this idea of follow-up care you have to talk about follow-up mm-hmm. care when mm-hmm. you're talking about the prosthetic mm-hmm. uh and orthotic field mm-hmm. and so yeah the the parachute in model mm-hmm. not great and one thing that mm-hmm. is very interesting and this is what i tell people when they're looking at nonprofits to uh, donate to or whatever is if there's a bunch of um if you go to their social media go to their mm-hmm. website if it's a bunch of pictures mm-hmm. And no video. <laughs> Bad love news. It, love it. Yep. If there's yeah. if there's no video, yeah. that means there's no outcomes. Yeah. There might be smiling people, but they're not wearing their prosthesis. So yeah. um, it's it, video does not lie. Okay. Um, and so you know that's just a little hint for people that you know who do I donate mm-hmm. to if I want to mm-hmm. help uh, a mission or whatever mm-hmm. of prostheses. Yeah. Uh, you you want to do one that does a lot of video okay. and then, then okay then another approach we could talk about is just the local manufacturing so that to me is like is it kind of okay you're doing but then then you would just focus on either one of the smorgasbord options you don't have to do everything at the same time but you would then of course try to make as much as possible in that country right and that could be like like a you know the people are making things out of wood again with a lathe because that's what they have you know that could be very radically different prosthetics than we're used to but maybe they were made, made super duper affordable. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's interesting. And I was, uh, you know, that's where I was really surprised when uh, at this last AOPA with the hope to walk people, mm-hmm. they literally are using the same casting tape, fiberglass casting tape that you, you use to break your arm, or, you know? Yeah. So it's the casting tape and they're using that to make a prosthesis and they actually um, take an oak dowel and slide it through a PVC pipe yeah. as the pipe that attaches to the foot. Uh-huh. And um, that is actually testing better than the pylons that we use here in the U S yeah. because they're, they're, they're a little bit dynamic mm-hmm. and they're not, they're not going to break. Yeah. And so it's interesting, you know, that, that um, take on it. But I think where people make the mistake though, mm-hmm. is they focus too much on that, this idea of locally sourced materials. Mm-hmm. And they say, hey, we're providing jobs and that sort of thing uh, because they're sewing our leather. And I'm like, you know, you're not delivering that many prostheses. So it, it, it might take them like maybe an hour mm-hmm. to sew up all these leather straps and put some stuff together. So you're not you're not really giving somebody a job. I mean, it's a, it's it's more of a talking point. Mm-hmm. But uh, to another end of that is like if you actually put them on payroll, right, mm-hmm. and teach them. Mm-hmm how to make these devices, how to fit these devices. That's, that's when y- you level up and then allow those people to teach another people. And then that's a way to scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, I think that's really exciting, but, but that, I mean, I think, I think that really requires, you could do this in six months, you know, you, you, you that would require like you relocating the century. Uh, just like what Katie did. So you would have to like literally live there for a number of years in order, in order to find someone to pass the baton on who's local, I think, which is still, I don't think the scenario should ever be 20 years from now. Like we import a new Canadian every six months, you know, or, you know, you know what I mean? I think the idea of capacity building and them doing the manufacturing themselves should actually be them doing everything. And especially if we're talking about super poor countries where, where this kind of the infrastructure part of it is really, really uh, different. And then, and then another thing I, I want to point out is of course, it's like, I think we should talk about this. It's like the countries are all very different. You know, whether you go into Bolivia, which is a, uh, you know, they have very remote areas. Some of the areas are really poor, but there's also giant cities and it's also quite connected to the, to the world or where you go into some mega remote jungle area or a mega remote or a country that's, you know, South, South Sudan or something like that, that that's going to be a lot more difficult, you know? Uh, car or, or or Congo is going to be you know the the operating scenario. You know, Bolivia is already going to be going to be tough, I think, for a lot of people compared to the to the stuff, the comfort level you have in the states and all the stuff is going to be different. But if you all of a sudden translate that same model that could work really well in Bolivia, then you go to Congo, yeah, <laughs> good luck, you know. Well, and that's so true, and I think that's that's also important. Like when this the, when the war broke out in Ukraine and all that stuff, mm-hmm. all these prosthetists were like, oh, we can make them prostheses. Mm-hmm. 
you know, they didn't realize that Ukraine is a first world country. Yeah. Like this is not developing world. Mm -hmm. They're not going to go for your wooden pylon, mm -hmm. wooden foot mm -hmm. thing. It just, it's just not that it's not the right thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, and then you have, um, in the, the various areas where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going to the bathroom or, uh, is a squatting over a hole in the ground. Yeah. Well, you can't use the foot that I use yeah. because it doesn't have the range of motion to get into a really? squat. Oh, wow. That's a huge problem in large parts of Asia, large parts of uh, – also Eastern Europe, Europe as well. But yeah. Wow. Yeah, so you've got to think about that um, as far as, okay, so what are they actually going to do? And then, you know, you go into like a Middle East area, and uh, cosmesis is everything. How does it fill out the um, the, the apparel to make it look like they have mm -hmm. uh, two legs and, and that sort of thing or, or even the arm stuff? <laughs> And so you're right. It's it's different for every single one. And so anybody that is saying they have the answer, mm -hmm. they don't have the answer. <laughs> okay. You know, and you have to you have to enlist mm -hmm. um, lo local help to kind of figure mm -hmm. um, figure that out, or come alongside of them to help figure it out, mm -hmm. um, and not try to. Mm -hmm. um, Fit the fit the square peg in the round hole. No, I definitely. I, th I think, and also it's like local solutions with local people, not just. I think it's really like that white man's burden kind of stuff. That really kind of like horrible attitude where you know everything better and then you just come in like, ah, this is it. No, you don't know everything better. You you've been there for two weeks. You don't right. You don't even know how to. Like, you know, you can't even, you can't even navigate the place properly. And all of a sudden, you're telling everybody just because you're from like a richer country that you know everything better than that person. You know? I think that right, right. And I I think that's a big big time struggle and it's it it is a struggle. And, and you know, people want the the funding, right? Mm -hmm. Or the access. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of sometimes go just along with it mm -hmm. just to get that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but then you, you have two people communicating two different things with expectations in the two different ways and it can just be um a disaster. Mm -hmm. So But what what about uh, if we that's definitely something. And what about if we like separate the problem into two? Because this is like, you know, your iPhone, not this one maybe, well, this one kind of, right, but is, is going to be a 3D scanner. But the Calm app, we've seen how how that kind of works now for, for, for a lot of people. So imagine we could just, like, it's iPhone 17 or something, right? And we've got, like, the Calm Plus or something like that. and works even better than it does now. And the cleanup is even better than it does now, all that. You know, can we have a model where you just, like, you just, you take Bob. Bob's a local dude. He doesn't have to be trained. You give him an iPhone. You just say scan all the people. Is that a thing? Can we do that? And then you're like in North Carolina or whatever, and you're like going to make these things and then send them over. Can we do this? Is that a feasible thing? Do you think? I, I think so. Um, and, and, and it's not just, and I don't think it has to be a random person. Mm -hmm. So like one of the interesting thing is, uh, you know, medical centers exist everywhere. Um, and so there's nurses, doctors, mm -hmm. Uh, that are interacting with patients that know the anatomy and such that love technology, mm -hmm. you know, and I think about the orthopedic surgeon that wants to print his own um, medical models, mm -hmm. right? Why not train that guy mm -hmm. to take some scans mm -hmm. or he can train some nurses or what have mm -hmm. you, but maybe he's the main guy mm -hmm. to take scans and, and send them to, uh, you know, an area to be uh, produced mm -hmm. so that you're not having to learn. Okay. Mm -hmm another whole software and maybe that's part of the mm -hmm. journey it's like you take that burden off for a little bit get them really good at scanning mm -hmm. and then hey now we're going to take you through the journey of modifying so you could do it right there and then the the follow-up mm -hmm. is now you're going to be able to do it everything mm -hmm. to your 3d printer mm -hmm. and then what i want you to do is then show somebody else maybe in another country mm -hmm. or in the city down the road to do the same thing yeah, I think that would be really exciting, and also the print locally thing as well. But maybe use the the Americans' expertise to make the prosthetic because they don't have enough prosthetists there. Because we know that that's a huge problem with with these, and then we partially print them on site, and we maybe have a local prosthetist who now, you know, and with much less time, doesn't have to do all the work, you know, and and they can just fit like I don't know, ten people a day instead of two people a day, you know. Yeah, well, and and. So this this really resonated with me. It was about six, seven years ago. I had a doctor who was from India. Mm -hmm. Her dad had just had an amputation mm -hmm. and had been to all the prosthetists or, you know, you know, prosthetists or people that made prostheses around his city. Mm -hmm. And he still was not walking. And she goes, Brent, is there anything that you can do? 
And so I took her, and this was before scanning. So mm -hmm. I took her and showed her how to take a reasonable cast. And she brought that back to me and I actually made it. And then she had, ended up taking it to um, back to India to fit her dad. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much all set up. We had the measurements and all that stuff. And she uh, FaceTimed with me mm -hmm. and we got the alignment right. And then her dad was as happy as could be. That's crazy. And so I love so, this. It's, Wait a minute. I love this. It's so simple, dude. This is it's uh, it's, it's totally possible. Uh, That's all I'm saying yeah. is to to be able to use the expertise from uh, other areas if you're out kicked your coverage essentially, yeah. and it was a simple uh, you know phone call, a video call, and 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 I mean the technology is way better now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so there's no reason why that can't be done. Okay, I like that. That's very helpful because I think that we're we're using cell phones, the internet, all this technology to connect us, and 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 I think that that gives me a lot of hope that, that we could do at least part of this this kind of information value exchange like online, I think would make everything way, way cheaper and more, way more scalable as well. Like make it much bigger. Well, and you alluded to it, mm -hmm. you know, for me to hop on a plane to go to India, yeah. I have to leave my, you know, for one patient, mm -hmm. say if I was to go see her dad mm -hmm. or whatever. And let's just say I saw 10, you know, which is a lot of work for a week. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in, I'm into that for $2,000 mm -hmm. probably. I'm eating and food mm -hmm. and, and hotels, you know, maybe another $1,500 mm -hmm. and then the pieces and parts mm -hmm. for, for all that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I've left my practice for a week mm -hmm. uh, and the design stuff, like all that, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a fairly big sacrifice all the way around. Mm -hmm. So that the end price of that one prosthesis, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it's, it's going to be $15,000. But with her going back and forth, she's already seen her dad. We're mm -hmm. working together. Mm -hmm. We were literally into it for probably less than five hundred dollars. Super nice. I love this dude. This is really good. I like that. I like that example very much. Because yeah, you can take a lot. Yeah, a cast seems like this uh, seems like not a really insurmountable thing to do. And this is actually also how all these hearing aids, like millions of three D printed hearing aids, they get made, and it's like a custom wax impression of your ear that goes in a box, uh, and that gets scanned in another country. And that file is then used to, to, to make the, to then they customize the electronics inside of it. They look at the software and be like, oh, this is the electronics go this way. This is better for this uh, one. And they print it out and then they send the thing to the people. So that's like, you know, that, and that's being done like tens of millions of times. You know? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. I mean, a lot of people, and I think that there's, I think it's something to be achieved, but they look at, you know, hearing aids and um, a dental, mm -hmm. you know, as a great, as parallel to the prosthetic realm, but I would I would say too though is those are dimensions that don't change, right? Mm -hmm. Your teeth and gums, and your, same thing with your ear stuff. You can be pretty close, mm -hmm. and you're going to still have a result that's mm -hmm. that's reasonable. But this is also where it's exciting for 3D printing mm -hmm. because we have materials that we've never had to use before. So I believe, mm -hmm. and this is just through we've had Richard on. Uh, remember the marathon guy mm -hmm. where we used his same shape that was not working for him to run the marathon or to even train, mm -hmm. but we changed the materials yeah. and now he ran a marathon. Mm -hmm. So I think you have that opportunity in 3d printing mm -hmm. where you have some materials and you, we've talked about air pockets mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, even with FDM mm -hmm. where even if they have some some variability flexibility, you have some protective mechanisms that are automatically built in that it is maybe a suboptimal prosthesis. Mm -hmm. But because we're using these technologies to their fullest extent, mm -hmm. we're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. But then, can we make? Is there a universal fitting? Like you know these boa clips, you know you know I'm obsessed with them. But but can we use them to make one prosthetic that'll fit everyone? You know what I mean? You know what I mean? That, that we have like a prosthetic and then you, you just adjust the screws to telescope the, the middle bit out and up and you can you know, make everything bigger and smaller. Is that, is that a conceivable thing? Kind of like a Ikea prosthetic that could deal with like a lot of people or. I think it's an interesting thing and I think it's something that we should strive to, but I'll never forget, you know, we had that um, David Boone on and he touched on how all the surgeries are different. Yeah. Uh, Right. So every solution is different and no, everybody talks to the prosthetist about how, well, you don't have a good fitting prosthesis. Well, no, you did a bad job doing the surgery. Mm -hmm. And so we have that situation too, where all these surgeries mm -hmm. are not consistent. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then the other part of that is many of these surgeries are due to people, dysvascular disease, diabetes, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so if you automatically give them something like a BOA or something, mm -hmm. they don't have feeling a lot of times in their legs. Uh, so okay, it could okay. actually uh, yeah. be worse for them. Yeah. So this is where having these air cushions and that sort of thing, I call it kind of like oops, like, okay, the process may not be that good and the patient's not mm -hmm. very compliant. Well, if we use the right materials, we might still have good outcomes. That's okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I get it now. I think I get it. Now. I think it's a good point. I think that it, it kind of increases your safety factor, your comfort factor, just by by having a lot more uh, better material. I think that's a good point. I didn't I didn't realize that. I think I'm really really happy you made that. But okay, how about this? The great big library of prosthetics. So we take everybody's old prosthetics, we put them together, and then we scan everybody else who needs one, and we match them up. Then your prosthetic twin gets your old prosthetic, and they're, you're, they're exactly the same size. You have exactly the same thing. Now, uh, something well, other, you know, you know? There's, it's it's sometimes it's not far from that. Mm -hmm. um, we we actually uh, last year had a guy. He was <laughs> this is this is hilarious. Mm -hmm. He was a left above the knee amputee. Yeah. Saw uh, a right above the knee amputee yeah. leg on eBay. Yeah. Bought it, chopped it up a little bit. And he was walking around on it. What? It was suboptimal, but I think it does point to the yeah. resilience of of people and people's tolerance. Right? Yeah. People want to be up and walking. Mm -hmm. um, so I always hate the saying, "Well, you know, it's it's enough." Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, especially with the three D printing and scanning and things like that, I think we can get a lot closer to enough and be comfortable and have a good outcome rather than these suboptimal, like kind of what you talk about, the, this library and we match you up mm -hmm. close. It, it, I mean, this guy took a right and made or a left and made it a right mm -hmm. or uh, the other way around yeah. and was doing okay. Yeah. So I think that there's a little bit of room between a very well-fitting socket and somebody taking the wrong side yeah. <laughs> and putting it together. I think that there's can be a very happy medium where it's good enough mm -hmm. and, um, and you're off to the races. Okay. Okay. I think, I think that's, I think that's a really good approach. And I think, you know, are we, are we seeing also like another thing we have to discover, is there a lot of DIY stuff, like stuff uh, I'm triggered a little bit by this, this, this woman doing the casting herself, you know, can we put a lot more work in the by the the, the person that needs this prosthetic if they if they're going from having nothing to getting something good enough? Can we have like a more DIY kind of a thing, the thing where they're more involved in the making process, the thing that where they do part of the work? You know, because hey, I would do that if if my option is like I have to do part of the work or I'm not walking. Then hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna be like you know I'll I'll take your online class. You know what I mean? I'll I'll do it. Is that is that something you would you would believe in as well? Or? I think, I think hundred percent, you know, and I think, you know, when we talk about like scanning and that sort of thing, uh, or even the casting, I mean, casting material is available anywhere, mm -hmm. um, in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's, there's definitely some options, mm -hmm. um, there. And, and I think the other thing is that there are some people kind of coming down the line that are using, uh, instead of photogrammetry, they're using like this videogrammetry. Mm -hmm which it doesn't really matter what mm -hmm. um, mobile device you're using. Mm -hmm. So almost you know, the, most, a lot of people have mobile devices mm -hmm. or at least they know somebody mm -hmm. with a mobile device. Mm -hmm. And so that can make it more accessible into that DIY mm -hmm. um, area as well. So I don't think that's far off. I think where you, where you, can really run down the rabbit hole mm -hmm. is the rest of the stuff, the alignment, mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. So it's like, it, it's a, it's a whole package type of mm -hmm. deal. So you've got this fitting and then you've got, how does it fit in 3d space? Mm -hmm. How is the person walking? Mm -hmm. Um, it, you know, is it tall enough, short enough, that sort of thing. But, um, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think that is, that is a very interesting take. Mm -hmm. Yes. But then, okay. But imagine we had a really good 3d scanner, right? Big three scanner, and we traveled around like some uh, less than developed country. Let's say, and we did that, and then a week later they come back. We print it, and they come back. We'd scan them again to see how the alignment's working, and we scan them again to see how they're walking. I mean, the only thing that really needs to be local is the scanning. If we can tell all of those things from the scanning, right? I mean, if we can get a, an accurate assessment from just the scanning or the video of the person or that kind of thing, and then we can do all of the other stuff remote. Yeah. 
You know? Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and here's the other cool thing mm-hmm. is, you know, we talked about some local supplies and all that stuff. Um, I, I believe that these materials are getting good enough to where we're going to be able to prevent, uh, print feet mm-hmm. and such. So you're, you, mm-hmm. you're going to be able to print the socket and the foot, mm-hmm. and then you just need something to connect the two. Mm-hmm. And that could be and, like a uh, strip of aluminum lot, or whatever. That could be, that could, or, yeah. or, or whatever. It could be a bam piece of bamboo. Mm-hmm. I mean, bamboo is very uh, mm-hmm. strong. Um, but I think so. A lot of people are like, "Well, Brent, you could then just print the whole thing from the top to the bottom." Mm-hmm. Um, you can, uh, which is called exoskeletal prosthesis. It's been around for uh, forever, but you have zero alignment capability. So let's say you miss the alignment by just a few degrees and you print it all together. That's not, that's not good. Um, and so being able to make a quick alignment change via a pipe or whatever is, is going to be your most effective way to go um, for the best outcomes. And uh, so I wanted to make that clear too, because I, I, t- I actually take probably, you know, uh, a message at least probably once a month about this idea of, oh, you could just print it all together. The people that print it all together have aligned everything first and then scanned it, which may be a great model to do, but they don't go straight into putting it all together. You're on mute. Uh, okay. So I take the patient first and then online or what, 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 what's the difference? Well, so you know how we talked about the pipe, um, you, where you connect the socket to the foot and there's a pipe in the middle and you can actually change the alignment. Um, a lot of people are like, well, why don't you just print it all together? Well, you, you, without knowing what the patient's true alignment is, you can't print it all together. Um, but what you can do mm-hmm. is say on their first socket, you have this alignment thing and you dial in their alignment and they shrunk. Well, you can take their 3D socket down and then um, capture their alignment in a scan, and then you could 3D print it all together if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. But right out of the gate, um, it's it's literally like gambling. Um, okay. There's there's it's very unlikely that you're going to hit it. Okay, okay, that's good to know. I mean, I think. And then there's the the the, the other example. Okay, what if we just made? This is also always comes up when we talk about customization and 3D printing. What if we made a thousand sizes of prosthetic? Right with a thousand sizes of this, can we can we do like a big library of standard things? Maybe it won't work for everyone, but it'll work for thirty percent of people. These thirty percent of people, boom, easy. You come in, you set a size three plus a size five plus a size nine, ta-da, you're done. So then we don't focus on making the custom solution for everyone. We just say like, okay, with these hundred sizes of each part, the hundred sizes foot, hundred sizes brace, hundred sizes of whatever, we get thirty percent of the people. And we just need to take some simple measurements. And then these are the easiest low hanging fruit dudes and we just help them. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what you can do with uh, transfemoral or above the knee prosthesis because you're only dealing with one, with one bone. Right. And typically it's a fairly easy surgery and such. And so there's a lot of truth to that is you could have a small, medium and large left and right Mm -hmm. and, and be good to go. So I Mm -hmm. think that is definitely a, a really important, option mm-hmm. um for that for the trans tibials you know especially in the developing world it's a it's a whole nother thing because you have um uh, traumatic amputees congenital amputees mm-hmm. these patients that have had diabetes really terrible um mm-hmm. you know uh, uh amputee, like if there's so much variability mm-hmm. in the below the knee i think it makes it more difficult now with that being said though is you could have some dimensions and then there's materials now like i think like a part a part b foam mm-hmm. where you, you you can pour it together have them put their leg in there and it, it kind of expands around their leg and now it's custom mm-hmm. you can do that with polycarpolactone so as well to, to polycarpolactone heat fits to you and these foams as well then then you can get but that's yeah okay you could do that as well and then also like latex like materials for the outside okay that could be interesting yeah, yeah. So I think, and there's, there's, uh, there was one group that did that, something similar. But here's the other cool thing, and and um, with the shapes and such, I, I believe that um, if you 
have the right lattice structure or bladder size, or say if, if some of that's modular and you can kind of almost, you know how you can put the dots in the Crocs, the, mm -hmm. the little, the, in the holes of the Croc shoes, mm -hmm. you know, you put the little thing, mm -hmm. you could do something very similar mm -hmm. um, to that and get things to fit. And you could do that with FDM and that would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, yes. Um, but what would be great is to have a company mm -hmm. take some of their application engineers, they make this little passion project for them, like a company like, you know, a bigger one that has a bunch of, uh, mm -hmm. of resources and they take it on as a passion project and mm -hmm. say, Hey, over the next two years, this is what the results do we want to be. We're going to okay. work on this. We're going to do a couple yeah. things and, and, then, okay, and then, the, then you're off to the races. There, there was a solution. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something we almost didn't. We've gone like kind of the NGO route and looked at this as a technological problem, right? But I remember at one point, but Enable, there were people selling this. When Enable is like donating these hands and stuff like this, there were people selling the Enable hands in Mexico for a couple hundred bucks, right? So how about yeah. let's? This is a business opportunity, right? How about somebody saying we are actually a startup that is going to bring prosthetics to the 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 the, the developing world? Do you believe in that kind of model, like a pure commercial model? Somebody just saying like, you know, we're going to have like my first prosthetic or something, like a low cost prosthetic, or we're going to open a whole bunch of clinics everywhere. Do you believe in that kind of thing? I do. Like I believe in definitely entrepreneurship. And, I, and you know, I think this is where it gets interesting and the semantics get very interesting. You have these NGOs mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot of them will say, hey, you um, you can pay for your device and it will go and, and, and you, that money will go back into the business essentially. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else will walk mm -hmm. or you have this thing. I mean, and a lot of people will call it like a social enterprise type mm -hmm. of thing where they're not trying to really make a profit. They're covered, trying to cover their costs, but they're backed by say some investors. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's one and the same. I mean, yes, it is commercial and, and that sort of thing, but it, investors, donors, um, the reality is, is a lot of these people do not have the money to pay full price for these things. So they're going to be subsidized in some sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just from what, what I've seen, right? I, I don't want that to be true. I'd love for it to be completely self-sufficient, mm -hmm. but I don't want to be naive enough to uh, also on the same thing and say, oh, this is going to be self-sufficient because the people that are missing limbs and such, these are not the the people that are, are, you know, the wealthy of the wealth, they, they can fly to the U S and go to the best process and, and get their stuff the way they need to, mm -hmm. which, which I don't necessarily agree with either because mm -hmm. they're going to have the same problem. Once they get back mm -hmm. in, they're going to change in size and such. And mm -hmm. so staying local is very important. Mm -hmm. So I think really the answer lies in somewhere in between. There's a hybrid model of like, you have somebody skilled enough that can take care of these mm -hmm super high end things, or maybe you do a clinic once a month or whatever, where you bring in a process from out of town or whatever, mm -hmm. that allows you to help you learn and be on this journey of being coming a better process. But you take care of the high end, the well, you know, things that can be paid, they're self funded, that mm -hmm. sort of thing, and use some of that money, then to um, pay for or subsidize these prostheses that are low cost, say sub 500 or mm -hmm. dollars or so. And, but you give somebody a job, mm -hmm. you give multiple people a job learning mm -hmm. this trade. So I think you can do that through the NGO. I think you can do it through a social enterprise. I think you just have to be super honest about mm -hmm. what, what is actually going on in the back end, Right. Mm -hmm. So there's so many times it's like going back to the photo ops and stuff. Well, we had this team come in, you know, there were 15 of them that mm -hmm. came in and they stayed at the best hotel and the, they flew first class mm -hmm. and all that, you know, it cost them $60,000 to get here. Mm -hmm. Well, that $60,000 goes a long way mm -hmm. in providing prostheses to people. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and they didn't really even have to come. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a balance um, mm -hmm. with any of that, but I love the idea of entrepreneurship um, and making it happen. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that uh, what we've had issues with, with life enabled, and this is, you know, I talked to a bunch of people, but especially like in the area that we go, which is the jungle of Guatemala, mm -hmm. it's not, uh, there's not a lot of people that love being up there. Mm -hmm. It's hot all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and dusty there's, there's, it has its own challenges with the, when the rain and all mm -hmm. that stuff comes, everybody wants to go live in the city mm -hmm. where it's 
you know, the land of eternal spring, the coffee is amazing. You get up and it's 65 degrees and it may get to 80 degrees. Like that is the life, right? And you have malls and Walmart and all that stuff. And so one difficult thing that we've had a problem with is when you give somebody a skill that is in, um, uh, that other people want, mm-hmm. right? They will leave mm-hmm. and follow the money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we've had, yeah, yeah. we've had two clinic, uh, two clinicians that we've, you know, trained and such that move, move to the city. Mm-hmm. I don't blame them for doing mm-hmm. that. And, and luckily we've had other ones coming behind them, but, but, um, now they're in a in a situation where they're they're talented, they're good enough, and they're making um, good money, but they've left um, mm-hmm. the people they were serving, mm-hmm, all right, mm-hmm. and for for money itself. And so that's that's a difficult difficult thing, and I don't fault them for doing it, mm-hmm. but I think we also have to be um, have a little bit of a reality check in. Mm-hmm. Is these skills are very valuable. Mm-hmm. And these, and they will be able to level up, mm-hmm. and uh, there's a chance that you will you will lose them. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. I think I think that's good. I think that's a good point. I mean, um, and then okay, then the other approach I think I think which we also haven't considered is like let's say the exoskeleton approach. I'm going to call it the exoskeleton approach. Like, you know, imagine the exoskeleton just becomes a product. So we get a productized technological solution for all the workers in the world to be able to work harder because everybody gets an exoskeleton, something like that, right? But there's other things that could do with this. You know, we can see this happening with robotics. We saw how quickly all these robotized vehicles are conquering or or, 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 or these electric vehicles are conquering the road, not the cars, but all these other like wheeled vehicles and car and and the little bicycles and stuff like that. So so do you believe that there's maybe a you know a technological solution that competes with that whole kind of like charity slash uh, orthotist driven stack, if you will, that, that there's just going to be some product Buy this thing now. Yeah. I mean, I, I think so. one interesting thing is, and like now that you brought this up and then we've kind of foreshadowed a little bit, mm-hmm. but, um, like in the Northern part of Guatemala, where we go, mm-hmm. the, the hospital, which is a not-for-profit hospital, um, they will also let private surgeons come in mm-hmm. and use their OR suite. Mm-hmm. Um, because they have endoscopy equipment. Okay. okay. Yeah. So specialized equipment, yeah. right? And so these doctors are are there um, pretty frequently because they're they're able to do these jobs mm-hmm. um, very well. So it would be interesting to have something very similar in that sense of, uh, say, it's a nonprofit organization. It allows a prosthetist or whatever, or they could be a traveling prosthetist mm-hmm. or what have you. Mm-hmm. Hey, we have this lab that's set up. And, um, you know, for you to come and use it, Mm -hmm. you can come see your patient, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, we want you to see 10 of our patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Mm -hmm. that's a way that where you barter some of that Mm -hmm. skill or what have you, and it allows them access to technology that they would otherwise not have. Mm -hmm. And it gives us access to their skill that we would not otherwise have. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very interesting thought Mm -hmm. uh, on, on that. And then, um, and then how do we, find those mm-hmm. medical professionals mm-hmm. that are going to stay in the area that have family mm-hmm. in the area that are, that are well-established that have an established mm-hmm. practice. How do we get them to incorporate this into their clinics mm-hmm. um, and take care of people? I think that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or like, then there's another model, which is kind of analogous to this is kind of closest. Imagine we do in Guatemala, in the jungle, we have a central fab, right? And the central fab makes stuff for America. These guys are getting paid well for Guatemala. They're laughing. They'll stay because they're getting much higher salaries than they get in the city and the the, the jungle. The living there costs peanuts, whatever. Right, so they're staying. They're doing all the manual labor stuff that the fabricator people do. And that gives us a cost advantage by shipping these things to America. And then meanwhile, with all, you know, the, uh, two days a week, we're making uh, low-cost prosthetics for, for, for Guatemalans for free. So then we have a hybrid as in, we're doing the fabrication in a low income country or lower income country. Um, and then uh, we're using that to, 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 to actually like make, you know, skilled people, a, a, a product for America as well. So, and I, I oh man, I love that, yeah. that idea. And I think, I think that's a great, I had not considered 
that aspect of like, okay, so how do you make it if they're following the money? Well, how do you get them to follow the money to stay home? You know, essentially. Um, so, and I think we've talked about this before is the real key to any of this is design. Mm -hmm. So if you can, if they have an internet connection mm -hmm. and you say you set up some computers somewhere that, you know, they all have haptic devices and what have you, mm -hmm. and you set up central design right there in Northern Guatemala, mm -hmm. Uh, I think that you're onto something there mm -hmm. because now they can help me design the stuff mm -hmm. that I need for the U S mm -hmm. they're also designing low cost prostheses mm -hmm. for, you know, the jungle of Guatemala mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Belize and Honduras mm -hmm. and all the surrounding countries mm -hmm. and, um, and they're getting paid well mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think it's great. Yeah. But I like these kind of things because then you're like engineering a solution. It's not something like mega breakthrough. We don't have to change the world. We just have to give the right people the right incentives and then all of a sudden, magically, to work, right? Maybe for whatever, uh, two times uh, minimum wage, the guy won't stay, but four times he will. And then it all of a sudden makes sense for us. And also for him, it's like, he, you know, he's laughing all of a sudden at four times minimum wage in the jungle. And then he's like, ha, you know, whatever, I'll buy a house with a pool. Fine. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. I really like that. I like that a lot, yours. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, I think that's, that's an interesting exploration as well. But, um, and then the other thing is like, okay, the, we're looking at funding, right? So we, we haven't really considered funding because either okay, NGO or commercial or some kind of mixed mash thing. Of, of uh, but How about, okay, the first one, I've always thought about this. I think everyone's thought of this. We sponsor them. Your knee is brought to you by Coca-Cola and it says Coca-Cola on the knee. You know, is that going to work? I mean, companies get involved with this, but they seem to be, you, you said me, tell me, you told me before, like I think it was offline. You told me like something about like they're more interested in the pictures, like, you know, you know, do you think of that like like you know, Lockheed makes one thousand knees possible in in some country? Do, do you think that is so, something, or do you think that's not going to be a sustainable thing? Or we really need a commitment from one organization or whatever? I think it would be interesting. You know, I think it, it and if you could get enough of these corporates to to take on specific mm -hmm. parts of it, like like Coca Cola, Coca Cola is everywhere, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if they have Coca Cola on their knee. Mm -hmm. And it does, you know, it's bright red or, or mm -hmm. whatever, and it's got Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's good branding, advertising, mm -hmm. all that stuff, and they're doing good things for people. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, you know, I think another thing that would be very interesting is you get some one of the polymer companies or, mm -hmm. or what have yeah. you to be uh, involved okay. in the socket stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you have this, you know, whole complete mm -hmm. um, system, mm -hmm. essentially, that is brought to you by corporations mm -hmm. and um I think that's very interesting. I, I love, mm -hmm. I love that model. And, and I, th I think touching on this idea of sustainability too, like mm -hmm. a lot of these companies have like endowment funds or trust funds or what have you, where, you know, they're donating based on the interest coming in. So mm -hmm. if you can get a commitment long-term, I, I don't care. That's sustainable. Mm -hmm. That's as sustainable as having, mm -hmm. you know, investors invest, you know, a million dollars in the middle of, mm -hmm. you know, Uganda or something. Mm -hmm. But when that money runs out, it runs out. Well, no, at least you've got a little bit of a runway, you know, mm -hmm. with something like that. Um, I, I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think I, th I would always worry about how long is their commitment? What do they want out of it? Will it fit? Uh, you know, will, will, you know, are they just going to suddenly say bye or going to do it four years, not the fifth? I think I think that would really worry me. I think in that that that, in that sense, they'd be easy. Like I said, I think it's a good idea. The polymer idea. Like I could imagine if if you get a BSF or somebody to keep donating one metric ton of this stuff, they're just going to do it forever. Because like for them, whatever, this is great, right. okay. great marketing, whatever. It, it, you know, but if you if they need to keep finding the cash somewhere, I think maybe at one point you might you might be a little bit, yeah, you might have a little bit of a budgeting problem. Yeah. Well, and this is where I think it would be interesting for a company to pick it up and do the kind of the initial mm -hmm. um, project, so mm -hmm. like scope of project, and then where they're only, and then, you know, the end result is how do we make sure that all we're doing is we're not giving cash anymore. Mm -hmm. We're actually just donating material mm -hmm. or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. I think that would be very interesting. Okay. And then and the other model, I think, I think uh, you thought of this before is like, is this idea of like, you get a leg, you get like a plus one leg or something. So you tell like your person in the States, like, Hey, pay 500 bucks extra. And then we'll give you a, le a person, a leg to a person in Guatemala. That kind of idea of like, I know people that Tom's try to do this. There's people trying to do this for shoes and all sorts of other things. Can we do this for prosthetics as well? Where you just say to the people like, you know, for this amount, this other person will also get something or something like that. Another person in the same situation as you. 
or I think yeah, think I, mean, I think I, I would say that I mean, especially in the U.S., that probably already happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say most people probably go ahead and 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 donate that. Mm-hmm. I think what's interesting, and that's what's happened most recently, though, mm-hmm. is some of these companies, and we've talked to some companies that have had some pretty significant consolidation and such, and so they have some clinicians that um, they're willing to give time, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to go somewhere mm-hmm. or be a part of a project. And so like we have a, um, a group going to the Ivory Coast mm-hmm. um, and um, Bionic, um, Sagar, and we had Sagar and Tony on, um, said, hey, we've got two clinicians that would love to go with you guys. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're going to um, take care of their vacation time. We'll pay them while they're gone, you know, that sort of thing. And that is super cool. You know, you get um, this, you get uh, another company kind of behind you Mm -hmm. and then they're going to donate some components and Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. I think that sort of kind of um, social commitment where we're, these companies are saying, Hey, you can take the time, whether it's, you know, here local, or if you want to actually travel somewhere. And then that becomes sustainable where you can build some of these teams even design teams, you know, that, uh, cause there's sometimes where I will take a file and I'll be like, you know what, I am so busy right now. I cannot crank this out. Can I send it over to you? And they're like, yeah, no problem. I'll fit it into my schedule. And then I get this file back and I haven't had to touch it. They feel good because they've helped. It's a, it's a great thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this is the one I think I've been sharing for last, cause I think you're being least enthusiastic about it. But look at, we have the AI based super scanning Autobot prosthetist. You know, we take the prosthetist out of the loop. I could just scan using my phone and then magical the algorithms, all those super busy algorithms will design and maybe print or partially print this whole thing in an automated way. Is, is that, you know, I don't know if that's desirable, right? I, I think, I think, you know, with alignment, back issues, whatever we, we want to be. But, you know, surely someone is going to do that eventually, something like this. AI well, it's funny. Based, I mean, know? yeah, I mean, so MIT had a project a while ago. They had this, like, fitting thing that had these, like, spring-loaded things that came down and evaluated the tissue underneath nice. and all that stuff. Yeah. Nice. And, yeah. uh, you know, it was super cool, right? I forget how much it cost. Mm-hmm. I mean, it died. I mean, the thing is, like, there is a way to overcomplicate the prosthetic stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you can maybe focus in the software side of things, but the bottom line is there has to be, uh, at least right now, there has to be some sort of human interaction that can turn the screws, put stuff together, cut stuff, grind stuff, that sort of thing, mm-hmm. um, to, to really make a go at it. But I, you know, when I say all that, but the way some of this TPU stuff is going, maybe not, it's maybe it's more like a shoe and some flaps and some mm-hmm. strings, you know, that go together mm-hmm. and kind of pull everything together. Mm-hmm. I think, I think that's going to be um, something worthwhile looking at. Okay. Well, Brent, I thought this was really great discussion. I think it was really wonderful. I think I hope we, uh, we inspire people to think about this stuff in, in, a, in a broader way. I think I hope that that, that was the thing that's what I think uh, would be nice for people to think about these angles and these different ways of thinking about this stuff. And uh, yeah, it'll be really valuable. I think. I think so too. I think it was a great discussion as eye opening for me, you know, on some of this stuff. And I, and I hope, you know, we can uh, continue the discussion. I think the thing that we can agree on is it's a fragmented industry, which Mm -hmm. is kind of silly to me. Mm -hmm. Like you've got different people all over the world doing it different ways and Mm -hmm. they won't talk to each other. Yeah. We we gotta, we gotta stop that. (laughs) No, no, that's a good idea. Just generally like figure out best practices from everywhere and then, and then everybody getting together on the same page on at least, or finding other people that are doing the same approach. Like even if it'd be valuable, everyone is a pure NGO people that only want to make wood lathe prosthetics. Right. If those guys, all 20 of them or something got together and said, we're going to make it all out of local hardwood or whatever, because that's how we are. And they, they, they learn from each other. I think that would be really valuable as well if all those little different groups and factions got together, you know, let alone yeah. everyone agreeing on like one approach or one thing or one solution. You know? Yeah. Well, and I think that's important. And I think, you know, if you took all the NGOs mm-hmm. everywhere in the world, mm-hmm. I bet you mm-hmm. that they didn't deliver 10,000 processes last year. Really? I have no idea. I don't know. And there are over 35 million amputees. Yeah. Okay. So w- w- 
all, all that to say is we've got to be better, mm-hmm. right? If we if we truly yeah, but even want, if they did a million, even if they did a million, that it wouldn't really address the problem because then, look at you. By the time it you got to everyone, the problem. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So everybody is fighting over whose whose idea is the best, yeah. and we didn't even touch one percent of people. Yeah. We didn't even touch point one percent probably. Yeah. And and so that is where I think the discussion needs to be: is how do we get all these people? Mm-hmm on the same page. And that includes me. And, uh, you know, you know, mm-hmm. I was, I was, uh, you know, very much in the blinder mode thinking that I'm doing things mm-hmm. the right way. And, um, but now I'm definitely much more open to mm-hmm. it. And I think 3d printing software and all that is going to be part of this. Mm-hmm. I just don't know what part. I mean, uh, I think it's a really interesting space. I think it's really great. I think it was a wonderful conversation and I uh, hope you enjoyed it very much for listening to us and uh, this is another Prosthetics and Orthotics podcast with Brent Wright and Joris Peels. Have a great day.